Yeah, and I'd love to start with Evergreen because I think you, you called it a case study and I think it is, it's the most compelling vision I've seen of how the, for want of a better word, like intersectional or social justice ideology can turn into this very strange um, authoritarian force inside an institution. Mm -hmm. I'd love to play a clip from that, uh, the canoe, which is just mm -hmm. the most incredible scene. Yeah. I'd love if you could just talk through what's going on in that scene and yeah. what, what, what you thought when you first saw it. So at, at the time uh, that the Evergreen story kind of fell into my lap, I was looking at the scholarship and it looked like it was something more akin to theology than um, any kind of social science. It was more, it was more um, feeling out a moral system as opposed to some kind of you know, scientific process. A lot of it anyway, the deepest, darkest kind of postmodern side of this scholarship. And so it did really have this moral kind of religious element to it. And around that time when I was just getting my head around this stuff, the um, uh, Breton, Brett Weinstein, Heather Haying had written a, um, a story for the Washington Examiner and they, they linked to this piece of footage which was later I made it into this uh, a scene within the um, series that I, that I put up. It was the infamous canoe scene. Um, and it was just, it was one of the more fascinating things I've ever seen. It was just uh, people that were, it's really hard to explain. Well, you're probably gonna have to show it for people to understand what took place there. And we're gonna ask for key stakeholders that are on this campus to get on board our journey to equity. So what I'm going to do first is ask, this is the council. Our council is large, expansive, and we're going to, and we're going to get on a canoe. It was a group, the Equity Council of Evergreen State College had been given um, a project to create a, um, an equity proposal to change certain parts of the college. And they had this event, which wasn't really to talk over the equity plan, which, which they were mandated to create. Brett even said that they hadn't sent out the equity plan no. to anyone in there before they had the meeting. No, they didn't. He had to follow it up himself. So it was like, we're going to have this, this equity plan meeting, um, which was kind of billed as a discussion, I think. But what took place was, was more of a, a church service. It really did, it really felt like that. Um, there was a very kind of authoritarian, if you're not, if you're not for this plan, you're against us. It, was, it, was, it looked to me a moral community that was policing the outskirts. It was, you're, you're either for us or, or against us. And we're gonna get on a canoe that's gonna sometimes have fierce waves, unbearable headwinds, and sometimes intentional or unintentional extra rocking of the boat because we're not on the same page or on the same heartbeat. If we need to have our canoe, and John, let me know if this is not okay. Can there be, th can it be three wide? Two wide, okay, so we gotta make this happen. You know, emotionally I'm on board with the idea of, you know, a canoe journey to somewhere but this looked like they had cloaked a freight train in the imagery of a canoe oh hold on one second hold on um the senior administrators um you have to ask for permission and commit some things before boarding the canoe so can we step back out So uh, I would like to board the canoe because I'm committed to enhancing and furthering uh, inclusion and equity in our campus community among both students and staff, faculty, and to do that with compassion and kindness. Um, personally, I am committed to making Evergreen a more student-ready campus, and as provost, I am committing resources to help train our faculty to become, to be able to promote equity and inclusion in the classroom 
and outside the classroom. There's a way in which you just, there's a sea of people engaged in a shared delusion. And then there's a few people witnessing the delusion and isolated, unable to exchange words or anything. That sense of being alone in a crowd is profound. And that, that really was how that meeting felt. And in a crowd of people who are supposed to be your colleagues. Yeah, who are sleepwalking. People were asked to first say that they were um, on board with this equity plan and then they would step on this imaginary canoe and then um, move together off to this, this magical land of equity. I know that sounds, it sounds insane, but uh, this is the piece of footage that was sitting in front of me. And so I saw this and I was already looking at this from the grievance studies perspective. Um, and it was just clear to me, I have to get this into my film somehow. Yeah. And so... What I did, because Pete is friends with uh, Brett Weinstein and Heather Haying, we, we sat down and they took me through the whole Evergreen experience that they had. And um, yeah, I turned it into a series, which will then be condensed into a scene for the, the feature film that I'm, I'm trying to create. Yeah, and I want to say that, that series on Evergreen, I think, I mean, I knew about the Evergreen story and I'd obviously talked to Heather and to, to Brett quite a bit in the past, mm. but it wasn't really until seeing that especially the canoe scene, but yeah. the whole atmosphere of those films that you put together, that yeah. it becomes really real. Yeah. And I'd really highly advise anyone who hasn't seen them to watch them because it just, you called it the case study and I'd, I'd agree it's, it's the kind of perfect example of what happens when this, um, I guess any, any, any belief system can become an ideology yeah. at times, but yeah. it shows that there is something sinister if these ideas are pushed to that, yeah. to that, extreme. This particular worldview of uh, systems of power being perpetuated through language, it's, mm. I, I know it's, it's strange and academic, but it's a particular worldview that if it gets to critical mass, you're probably going to see something within a closed system, right? Like Evergreen is a, it's a perfect case study for this thing because it's like a town. You've got your students, which are the populace, you've got the administration, which are, um, you know, your governance, you've got police services, you've got food services, you've got housing. And so it's almost like this, this perfect kind of uh, or, or case study. It's a Petri dish. Petri dish. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> if you want to take a moral angle on it. But um, I mean, it was. And it's, it's, it is, it's the canary in the coal mine, as far as I can see. is because if you roll these ideas out, they are built in such a way where that is the inevitable conclusion. And I think Benjamin Boyce is another one that um, his work I lent on quite a bit as research to create my series. And he has delved into this uh, a whole other level. So it's, it's worth looking at his stuff as well. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's an indication of what could potentially happen if this, this postmodern um, you, you left-wing utopian way is actually implemented in larger and larger scales. It's concerning. And with the, the, the grievance studies piece, yeah. what, what happened? Because I understand that it was, they, they were in, in the process of submitting more than the seven papers they got published, mm -hmm. but the whole thing got wrapped up. And yeah. So what was that like being sort of, so I think, I think the Washington, was it the Wall Street Journal that yeah. was about to publish on it? So. Um, in the end, it, they had to make it public yeah. uh, quite quickly. How was that being in the middle of that? Um, that was interesting. So they had, I think it was five papers that had been published and the most ridiculous one, which was about studying dog humping incidents to prove um, some kind of, um, to prove rape culture as evidence of rape culture, how people spoke about um, witnessing dog humping incidents. Okay. Is the letter okay in here? Yeah, yeah. Well, I just read my email. We have our first win. The dog park paper has been accepted. They don't know. We're about to tell them. I've got to read you something. Dear Dr. Helen Wilson, <laughs> I have now closely considered the revisions of your manuscript, Dog Park, and, <laughs> and will recommend its publication in Gender, Place, and Culture. 
You have done very good work to address the issues the viewers raised and have clarified your arguments. Thank you for your contribution to gender, place, and culture, and I hope to be seeing your manuscript in print. Yours truly, <laughs> PhD, managing editor, gender, <laughs> place, and culture. Uh, we have an accepted paper in the number one fabulous geography journal. Since approximately June of 2017, I, along with two other concerned academics, Peter Bergoshin and Helen Pluckrose, have been writing intentionally broken academic papers and submitting them to highly respected journals in fields that study gender, race, sexuality, and similar topics. We did this to expose a political corruption that's taken hold of the university. By this point, several of these papers have been accepted in highly respected journals, and one that claims that dog humping incidents can be taken as evidence of rape culture has been officially honored as excellent scholarship. I'm not going to lie to you, we had a lot of fun with this project. The, the reviewers are worried that we didn't respect the dog's privacy. <laughs> <laughs> That's the concern. But we respected the temple. <laughs> but don't let that lead you to believe that we're not addressing a serious problem. 